Hi, everyone. Welcome to Food Talk Live. I'm your host, Danny Nirenberg. This is part of our monthly series presented by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and Food Tank to highlight the work of the UN Food Systems Champions Network in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit taking place later this year. Today's conversation is the third of seven panel discussions featuring members of the UN Food Systems Champions Network. Each panel focuses on one of the Global Alliance's seven calls to action, which identify critical pathways to create a better future of food. It's my pleasure and honor to co-host this session with Ruth Richardson, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, and the Chair of the Champions Network for the UN Food Systems Summit. This panel will focus on the following call to action. Recognize and account for the positive and negative environmental, social, and health impacts and externalities of food and agriculture system policies and practices to inform decision making and to mainstream this and strengthen true cost accounting and other Im impact assessment tools, approaches, and methodologies to mitigate risk, increase accountability, and provide transparent, consistent guidance on integrated assessment and accounting for governments, farmers, corporations, the finance and investment communities, eaters, and other relevant stakeholders. This is an issue very, very close to my heart and something that I uh, have had the pleasure of working with uh, uh, with Ruth for many years, working on with Ruth for many years. So I'm really excited to uh, introduce our panelists to talk about this idea of true cost accounting in the food system. I'm pleased to introduce Zhao Kampari, the global leader of WWF's food practice. He leads the network's efforts to enhance the sustainability of the global food system. He is also the chair of the UN Food System Summit Action Track 3, Boost Nature Positive Production. Prior to WWF, Joao held the position of Special Environmental and Sustainability Advisor to Brazil's Minister of Agriculture. He has published two books on the economics of deforestation and co-authored the most comprehensive study assessing the carbon mitigation potential of low-cost improvements in land management. Thanks so much for being here, Joao. Next, we have Dr. Naoko Ishii, the Executive Vice President and Inaugural Director of the Center for Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. She's also the Vice Chair of Finance for the UN Food Systems Summit Champions Network. Prior to joining the university, she served at the Global Environmental Facility as CEO and Chairperson from 2012 to 2020. And she was Deputy Vice Minister of Finance uh, in Japan from 2010 to 2012. And she is the inaugural recipient of the 2006 Anoji Jiro Memorial Prize. I'm so glad you're here. We have Michael Taylor, the director of the International Land Coalition within the uh, International Fund for Agricultural Development. Before being appointed director in 2015, he was responsible for Africa programs and global policy at the International Land Coalition. And he was previously a program manager at the United Nations Development Program. Thanks for being here, Michael. And last but not least, we have Sandrine dixon de uh, She is the co-president of the Club of Rome. She divides her time between lecturing, facilitating difficult conversations and advisory work. She holds several advisory positions for the European Commission, and she is a senior associate and faculty member of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and a senior associate for EG, sorry, for E3G. Thank you all so much for being here and being willing to share your expertise. Uh, Ruth, I, I, I want to turn back to you. I'm, I'm hoping you can give us some of the background on work uh, that the True, uh, sorry, that the Global Alliance has been doing on True Cost Accounting, including your accelerator, and also some of the background on, on the TEAB Agri-Food Framework that you and I worked on and how that all was developed. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, for sure, true cost accounting has been part of the Global Alliance for the Future of Foods DNA since we started almost 10 years ago. Um, and for the benefit of anyone new joining us, the Global Alliance is a strategic alliance of philanthropies working together to transform food systems for today and for future generations. Uh, we have long believed that changing the tools used to assess food systems is an immediate way to take action that promotes human, animal, and planetary health. This is because today's dominant kind of simplistic economic productivity metrics like yield per hectare don't capture all the many, many ways that food systems impact the world around us. 
from negative impacts or externalities like habitat destruction, soil erosion, water contamination, displacement of indigenous peoples, diabetes, and so on. Or on the flip side, positive impacts like carbon sequestration, insect pollination, vibrant communities, healthy children. All of these go unaccounted for in the final price of food in policy documents and on balance sheets for better or for worse, depending if we're looking on the positive side or the negative side. So to help change the situation, like you say, Danny, we've been working in various ways. So in 2015, the Global Alliance started working with the UN Environment Program in collaboration with you and many others to convene over 150 scientists from 33 countries to develop what's known as the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity for Agriculture and Food Initiative, also known as Teabag for Food. Um, and we launched that in 2018. This framework created a truly universal, inclusive and comprehensive true cost accounting approach to describe the range of diverse and complex food and agriculture systems. And it's now being applied currently uh, by governments, by businesses and others around the world. We also launched what we call a TCA accelerator, which is really focused on trying to mainstream true cost accounting um, with a community of key actors as a tool, as the tool of choice to assess and shape um, sustainable food supply chains. Beyond the Global Alliance, there's lots of momentum building behind kind of new holistic true cost accounting frameworks. Um, the Dasgupta Review, um, the SEEA, which is the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, many, many others. Uh, generally, I believe that true cost accounting has really started to take root as one of our most powerful levers of change. Um, specifically, as the chair of the Champions Network of the UN Food System Summit, I know that it's front and center in many of the discussions around big opportunities to transform the future of food. And I think that the UN Food System Summit is a real moment to put a spotlight on the power and potential of true cost accounting and to figure out practical ways to make it real for companies, for countries and others. So ultimately what we're all driving towards here is the need to ask better questions, to embrace tools that enable us to look at the full system and to use things like teabag or food and true cost accounting to make informed, robust, equitable, and sustainable decisions about the future. So if it works for you, Danny, I'd like to use that as a jumping off point to hear from Joao as lead for Action Track 3 of the UN Food System Summit. Um, Joao, you moderated a panel for the Global Landscapes Forum 2020 conference, where there's a lot of talk about how important local context is to climate change action. So when we talk about local context, about nature positive production, about climate, this often leads us to very difficult questions about meat consumption, deforestation and other hot topics. How can true cost accounting help us navigate these difficult and contentious issues? You're on, you're on mute. Oh, no, still can't hear you. Danny, maybe we can go to the next question and we can come back to Joao once, uh, once okay, we get there. So, oh, there we go. Yeah. Now we've got you. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Very, Thank you. Very good, Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here, uh, Danny, colleagues. Uh, but, but, you know, I always like to start the conversation, like, before we begin to push responsibilities around. I mean, when we talk about food and, and true costs, we always look at others. Uh, that are imposing the cost of the planet. But before we begin to push this responsibility around to third parties, countries, governments, farmers, fishers, companies, and banks, let's pause for a minute and understand the first level of responsibility for the environmental cost the planet is facing today is our own, right? As individuals and consumers, uh, we need to be aware that what we choose to put on our plates has the power to transform and reduce the hidden costs of the food system on the planet. I'm a strong believer that repeated positive choices over large groups of individuals do send positive market signals to producers about what foods are more likely to be consumed. So if we collectively choose foods that are healthy and that are produced sustainably, that is with a lower environmental impact, the planet will have a really bright future. So the first level of responsibility is our own to reduce uh, the, the, the costs of the food system on the planet. 
But even the individual choice, though, may not be enough. We also need other measures that help create the right type of food environments, where our individual choices can be amplified. There is very little evidence uh, that education and awareness campaigns by themselves are effectively creating uh, large scale change. Therefore, we need both to raise awareness and deliver policies to create large and lasting change and reduce um, the, the cost of the food system on the planet. On the policy front, for example, there are four universal principles that countries could adopt to minimize greenhouse gas emissions if you take it from food consumption. The first one is to promote food choices that reduce environmental impacts while improving human health. The second one is to promote food choices that support production, that protects, conserves, and restores nature and sustainably uses natural resources. This is what we call nature positive. Uh, the third uh, principle that I always like to, to bring forward is that we need to embrace our countries and, and everyone needs to embrace flexible food choices that are healthy and sustainable and that embody rich and diverse diets and traditions of that country. Uh, now, there are country-specific actions that we, we, uh, we can see. Uh, for instance, the majority of food-related emissions uh, come from the G20 countries. So there is a big need for them to curb their food-related emissions than developing countries and therefore lower um, the environmental cost that the, the planet is facing today uh, when we talk about food system. And even within the G20, there is a huge variation. For example, Australia uh, is the highest, while countries like India, Indonesia, and, uh, um, uh, and India and Indonesia are being relatively low. So uh, all, all, you know, to, 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 there is no one size fits all solution for uh, reducing uh, the, the, the costs, the environmental costs that the food system is imposing on, on the planet. But in fact, the sum of local actions can help deliver global public goods, such as the, the um, global reduction of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Um, yeah, let me stop here and I look forward to the conversation moving forward. Thank you. Super interesting, Joao. Thank you. And I really appreciate you holding up both personal choice, but also within the context of, you know, enabling environments or disenabling environments for many, and also recognizing the difference sort of around the globe in terms of, you know, cause and effect. Uh, lots to dig in there. But before we, we do that, I think we'll go to, to some of our other panelists. So back over to you, Danny. Thanks so much, and Joao. I just want to repeat what you said, uh, because I think it's so powerful. You said what we put on our plates has the power to transform. And I think if we, there's a couple of takeaways uh, from, from what you said, that's definitely the most powerful. Uh, Naoko, I, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you gave an amazing TED Talk where you opened with a story about a Japanese fishing village um, developing a social contract around not overfishing to, ben to benefit everyone over the long term and how we need to recreate this notion of, of protecting shared resources on a global scale. Uh, there are so many ways that stakeholders are working together to make this happen, including through the UN Food Systems Summit. But where do you see room for improvement? And, and there are there sectors that aren't engaging as much that really need to? Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me to this very interesting conversation. Yeah, actually, the, <laughs> about this global commons dialogue, that the fact I see for the last eight years when I was at the G, if it's a part of this UN system, I see that the, this uh, the managing, stewarding global commons really needs a little more than intergovernmental system. We need a, a, a more like a social contract to bring that the consumers and the investors, the smallholder farmers and from small business to big business and, and actually almost every stakeholders to manage the global commons. And as already uh, many of you said, the current economic system doesn't really do it because that then, uh, uh, the negative or positive cost of the food system is not really counted in this uh, transaction. And as uh, uh, that, that Zhao already mentioned, this is, is a country to country system. It's not really uh, taking care of this broader multi-stakeholders. And that's why I actually end up now establishing the Center for Global Commons. So what I really want to see through this dialogue and the Food System Summit is how we can create this notion that we need to come up with a mechanism 
to govern the global commons, which is not just the local commons. If I am maybe very, very kind of maybe challenging, I think that the many local community have already found some way to manage the local commons. Why is that? Because they know exactly who are the stakeholders, that then they know that the fact is the mechanism that then one individual bad act is kind of harming the entire commons, the benefit, and they know that how to actually penalize those and the ones who breach the rule. That the problem we have now at this uh, uh, 2020 is we don't have that kind of the you know, local community, and we really don't know that an individual action is really harming or not harming, helping or not helping this global common. So our, our wish, that the, my wish, my dream is that how we can create that kind of social norm of that you know, to take care of stewarding global commons, but also it's a very practical way forward rather than saying that you know, yeah, it's important. We need you know, a practical, feasible, meaningful, instrument uh, mm -hmm. to to really realize this social uh, norm and uh, so that is the two things right that the uh, that narrative the recognition that we have a responsibility every one of us as Joe mentioned that uh, has this responsibility to steward global commons but the second thing what kind of a uh, practical <laughs> instrument we we can create at our hand this and a true cost accounting is definitely the very practical way forward because we were a little bit in the dark but my question for this community is how practical it can be how we mm -hmm. can close enough to to use it at our hand back to well, you you well, i would push back on you a little bit how practical do you think true cost accounting is for this what you've described how practical can it be well, unfortunately, as of today, I don't really see it yet. Uh, today, I actually chaired the Japanese business community about food system and from trading company to retail company to wholesale company to actually that does that the producers in landscape in Indonesia, everybody is looking for the true cost because they know that the, the, the current price doesn't include it, but they are, they don't have that the true cost and information at their hand. Yeah. So that that is really their plea that if this community can come up with something they can use to make the informed decision as a collective group. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on that just because um, I think this question of how practical it can be is really critical. And maybe the way to start to think about the practicality of it is to think actually about the different end users. And so I'd love actually to turn to Sandrine. Um, in a recent blog post uh, for the Club of Rome called Hedge Funds versus Visionary Leaders, uh, you discuss leaders with goals towards better climate change and labor practices, butting heads with short-sighted, profit-driven investors. So perhaps one of the, the end users or the audiences of this is actually those investors. So, Sandrine, do you see a role for true cost accounting with the finance sector, especially as a tool to better understand the benefits of sort of climate safe practices, even if it reduces profits in the short term? Yeah, absolutely, Ruth. And I love the way you guys have looked into all of our most recent publications. Well done, you. Um, I just wanted to bring in the fact that um, Danny forgot to mention that I'm actually co-chair of Action Track 5, which is around resilience. And the reason I bring that up is not that you forgot it, Danny, but only because, don't worry, <laughs> only because your question is exactly linked to that, right? I mean, coming from the Club of Rome and looking at a systems approach and knowing full well that actually we are facing a convergence of tipping points. We've just been through one of the greatest pandemic of all times. We know that actually that has had a direct impact on our food value chains. And you know, we've so far we've talked about how we can influence what's on our plate, but let's not forget those that don't even have a choice, but don't even have actually a plate in front of them, but are suffering from hunger, et cetera. And this brings us to investment decisions, but the entire financial system, which is completely geared towards short-term aims, that is not looking at resilience of the world's most essential goods. I mean, food is a public good. How do we actually allow for food to be a market which is only actually going to be judged upon short-term profits? 
This makes absolutely no sense. And what we're talking about now across the different action tracks is how can we use finance as a lever? But I would also urge, how can we change the finance system? So we start to place a value, which is exactly what you're doing within your action on what are the world's essentials. And food is an essential product. It's an essential public good. Now, we have also seen through the crisis that it is those companies that are ESG rated, so environment, social, governance rated on the stock exchange that are doing the best, actually, in terms of investments through the crisis. Why is that? Because they have de-risked their value chains, because they have already started to look at the impacts from climate change. They have started to look at the impacts from labor issues, et cetera. And that brings me to that blog, which was very much pushing a case that we need to support those companies and those CEOs that are making the right choices to push back. And we heard clearly Paul Pullman in terms of his shareholders saying enough around short term profit annual reports. We need to think long term. We need to build our shareholder value around a long term plan. So my call would be in whatever actions we put in place, both build a different shareholder value around long term financial benefits, which are linked to what is essential as well to mm -hmm. humanity, to our survival and to ensure that as we have further crises, we are resilient to those crises and we create an equitable food system for all people, not just those that have a choice. Sandrine, that's fantastic. Um, and I just want to pick up um, your point about using lever, um, sorry, finance as a lever for change. And I know that the action track teams have been working very busily to come up with um, recommendations, to draw in recommendations, to organize recommendations. Um, and you're in the midst of that. I'm wondering if there's any way you can give us a bit of a sneak peek in terms of any recommendations that might be coming up about how we practically use finance as a lever for change. Well, I think clearly true cost accounting is one of the, the key levers, right? I mean, we have to look at, first of all, shifting subsidies and using the revenue from subsidies towards positive investments in the agricultural sector, in particular around regenerative agroecology. And, and Joao and I have been talking a lot about this because it's a, it's a cross cutting issue that is both in the action track three and also in our action track around resilience. Um, we need to also look at the way in which we give the right signals. In fact, some of the conversations on finance have been, you know, how do we ensure that pricing signals are correct for the consumer as well as the producer? And how do we then also put in place the right taxation mechanisms to make that work? So when we are looking at finance, we obviously need to look at private finance flows but also public finance flows and taxation as working in sync to create that resilience that we want and to uphold the kind of one health, planetary people, prosperity aspect of what we're trying to do through the, the, the uh, food system. Great. Thanks so much, Sandrine. And I, you know, I think throughout this conversation, we've heard a lot about the need for more equity in the food system. So, Michael, I, I'd like to turn to you now. And the International Land Coalition's Uneven Ground Report, which came out uh, just a few months ago in, in November of 2020, sug suggests democratized and more equitable agri-food systems as, as one mechanism to create more equity in land rights. And, and so I'm wondering, how are our food systems connected to not only ecological health of land, but also to the social and financial health of communities. You're on mute, Michael, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I was just uh, thanking you for a great question and uh, and the opportunity to be part of uh, an amazing discussion like this. Uh, and you picked up really on on what for us is the key issue that when we talk about a system and in this case the food system and in our case as the International Land Coalition, the 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 systems that underlie that of access to land and natural resources. The first thing to note is we're talking about a very unequal system. We set out uh, at the beginning of last year uh, with um, about 20 partners around the world to try and understand 
what is the status of land inequality and uh, and what are the implications of that uh, and we were quite shocked by what we found out um working together with the inequality lab uh, of thomas piketty and his colleagues we uh, we realized by the end of last year that land inequality was 40 is 40 percent higher than we previously thought it was um just to give you what that means in terms of uh, in terms of figures that one percent of the farms in the world uh, operate um 70 percent uh, of the land um so you've got incredibly we're, we're talking about a very polarized agri-food and land system and a very unequal agri-food and land system so in this context um <clears throat> Coming back to um, to the, the your, your question about um, externalities, from our perspective, the perspective of, of of our coalition, we're a coalition of about 250 organisations uh, based in 80 countries around the world. Often, when our members talk about these kind of issues, um, the language of externalities doesn't resonate because it externalities implies that. Um, these the, the the costs that are paid are um, uh, costs or possibly even benefits that come on the side, uh, and 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 we're saying, you know, many of our members would say the issue is not the costs you pay or the benefits that come or the benefits that that you see on the side, but really, um, what's driving the whole system? What are we trying? What are we trying to achieve? Uh, and the reality is that many agri-food systems and many land systems that underpin them uh, are orientated towards corporate agricultural uh, sure. production systems. More and more we see the corporatization of agriculture. Now, 70% uh, of the food in the world is produced by small farmers. And so, and so the question really is, um, what kind of, um, of policy can support the food production systems of, uh, of small farmers? Um, how can we look at inclusive, environmentally sustainable and socially equitable uh, systems? And so, so the exclusion of small farmers that we see currently today is not a failure of the system. It's because the systems are deliberately designed to exclude them in many cases. Um, one of the uh, websites that, that we're part of is called the Land Matrix, and, and we track large-scale land transactions. Uh, around the world. So there's about a thousand, a bit over a thousand land deals in that database. And that shows that an area of about 20, 26 and a half million hectares has been acquired over the last decade by large scale corporate actors in the agricultural sector, primarily in other parts of the world, uh, often for food production. 42% of that is in Africa. Uh, to give you an idea, that's about 10 million hectares, about the size of, uh, of Iceland. Sure. Uh, of land in the hung hungriest region of, of the earth is, is, being, is being taken up for these kind of corporate food systems that are not feeding people healthy food. They're not supporting local uh, farmers. They're not benefiting the environment. They're increasing inequality. And so, you know, if I were to, if I were to think of, um, of your call to action, and maybe rephrase it from the perspective of of what many of uh, of our members would say important would be important would be something along the lines of how do we guide agricultural policies and decision making by inclusively defining a vision of resilient food systems mm -hmm. that are environmentally sustainable and socially equitable well M michael that's also interesting and these land grabs that are happening are are you know having a, a huge uh, impact on on communities as you said especially in sub saharan africa you know, whenever I think about land tenure, my mind goes to women, women who make up about 43 percent of, of the global agricultural labor force, but lack access to not only land, but when they do have land. A, a recent paper just came out um, by Dr. William Burke at, at Michigan State University talking about how women, when they do have land, they have the poorest land. They have the least nutrient rich land. And I'm wondering, you know, you work so closely on these issues. If you can talk about, you know, if, if women, for example, have had the same access to resources as their male counterparts, what the benefits of, of that would be and how true cost accounting can sort of encompass those benefits. Uh, you're raising a, a great issue there, Danielle. You know, it said that women feed the world, uh, but we would say they feed it on somebody else's land. Women 
women are sixty percent of the agricultural labor force, but own fifteen percent uh, of the world's land. And so, so right there is the issue uh, that that uh, a huge responsibility that women carry in food production is not backed up by any security uh, of rights. And as we know, in many cases, um, when women become widows or in 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 emergency situations like we have in in many parts of the world with the lockdown and and, and COVID, uh, it's it's women that are the first to suffer that have little to fall back on and um and the food systems suffer for that from the family through to uh, through to the community uh, and and the country and so securing women's land rights really must be among the first uh, the first of the issues that we need to uh, deal with. Uh, just to just to throw out, there are 164 countries in the world that recognize the equal rights of women to own and to manage and to use land as men. But only in 50 of those countries are those rights actually guaranteed in practice. So there's a huge task ahead of us, uh, uh, partly a legislative task, but really in a... a, a um, a, a, a task of making real the aspirations that many governments hold on to, but but don't actually uh, um, guarantee in practice. Uh, absolutely. Thanks so much, Michael. Ruth, if it's okay to you, there are a few questions from the audience I'd like to touch on. One is, uh, uh, what is the panel's opinion on how, on how agroecology can contribute to more sustainable food systems? Who Whoever would like to go first, Sandrine? I'm sure Joao will as well. We're, we're really having a big discussion on this. I think we're all in agreement that agroecology is, is very important. Um, and also all the points that have been made so far around the real stewards of the land. I mean, clearly we need to shift from a mul mul you know, monocrop, high intensive agricultural system, which, which is not creating the carbon sinks nor enabling our land to regenerate itself in the way that it should. So I think we, we need to look at, the, at a variety of different practices, whether it be called regenerative or agroecology, there are so many similarities, organic, etc. cetera. Um, the most important thing is the outcome. What we're looking at now is a food system that is resilient to future crises and that actually is much more positive as a way to enhance people's lives and stay within the planetary boundaries than destructive, which is what it currently is. The feedback loops between biodiversity loss and climate change and the food system are huge. So if we do not look at our food system and the land in which it's grown, in a way in which it becomes a positive contributor to climate mitigation rather than part of the problem, then we are all doomed. So I think it's absolutely a part of the solution. Absolutely. Joao? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'm with, I, I can endorse 100% what uh, Sandrine just said. And in the Food System Summit in Action Track 3, we actually have, are developing what we call a game changing solution, specifically looking into agroecology. But, you know, that rely on the principles of agroecology. So I encourage you to visit the summit's website and you are going to go into Action Track 3. We call out a box in our documents that bring the 10 elements of uh, agroecology mm -hmm. from diversity to rights based approaches to doing the right thing in agriculture. You know, so um, uh, we are a big defender of agroecology, uh, other regenerative and restorative practices, especially on soil. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's all there. It's part of the package. We need to really now scale out these agroecological principles and agroecological practices. Um, I'm not going to get the numbers right, but there was a huge, a huge uh, work that CGIAR did to review thousands of papers on agroecology. And here's what they found, that the majority of those papers, it, these are peer reviewed papers, uh, really identify the benefits of agroecology to people. So the social component of agroecology right. is right there. But there are not many papers, and these are in the hundreds, I can get the numbers right to you later, that talk about uh, agroecology and climate change and even fewer 
that relate agroecology with biodiversity. So what we're trying to do in Action Track 3 is to look at agroecology from the science perspective, from the evidence perspective, to elevate the profile of agroecological principles and practices so that this can be scaled out. You know, let's flesh out, let's do more research and development to really highlight the importance of agroecology principles and practices and other restorative and regenerative practices to climate change, to address climate change, and to reduce uh, biodiversity loss. So this is a big, this is at the front and center of Action Track 3's work of the Food System Summit. Over to you, Danny. Great. Thanks so much, Joao. You know, speaking about biodiversity, that's been a key aspect of all of the work that uh, the panelists have done. And, and it's, you know, certainly our current food systems are, are really threatening biodiversity. Can we talk a, a little bit more about what are the hidden costs of losing that biodiversity? And, and how can we make governments and eaters and, and, and companies, which we talked about a little bit earlier, more aware of, of these costs and how you know, we can shift to really focusing on the benefits if, and what will happen if we preserve biodiversity in, in you know, agroecologically sustainable ways? I don't know when, who wants to go first. Joao, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for giving the floor. Uh, look, when we talk about food production and its relationship to climate change, biodiversity loss, nature and, and climate in itself, we need to realize that, look, we can't phase out our food like we're doing with fossil fuels. Okay, mm -hmm. so that, that's a non that's a non-starter. And we also need to be, you know, we, we also cannot actually fall into the trap of vilifying the food system and agriculture and farmers and fishers or any sector who work hard to produce our food, especially farmers and fishers from small um, or low and middle income countries, small farmers from low and middle income countries. Uh, look at what the food system does to us, right? So the first part is to recognize what it does, what benefits it generates. And then we need to work within the system to transform it and help farmers and fishers you know, in making that transition. Having said that, we cannot ignore the fact that, one, agriculture responds to, uh, you know, to 49% of the ice-free land on Earth. It is responsible also for 75% 70 of freshwater withdrawals. It causes 80% of deforestation, and 52% of the farmland is degraded or degrading. So the drivers of the food system also cause 70% percent of the biodiversity loss on land, 50 percent of the biodiversity loss on fresh water, while fisheries are over harvested, you know, causing serious imbalances in ocean health. The food system also causes, as we all know, and uh, we've discussed this, causes about 29 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. So all in all, there is a, a, a figure from, from FOLU, from a report a couple of years ago, that the total value market value of the food system is $2 trillion negative per year because it delivers value in the order of $10 trillion, but it's, with, given all the hidden costs, is the order of $12 trillion, making the whole system $2 trillion negative. So we do need to support a just transition to a different food system, one that works for nature and that works for people together because right now, you know, recognizing all the good parts of and what the food system has done to us uh, over the past centuries, actually, you know, uh, but we do need to, to, to incorporate these hidden costs into our minds, hearts and plates. So uh, back over to you, Danny. Thanks so much, Sandrine. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Joao was saying and, and, and indicate that you know, we have to think about what are the key signals that are going out. And you mentioned again, the issue with, on the one hand, we need to look at, at, at smallholders, we need to look at farmers, we need to start to look at the impact of, of the food system. But then what about those companies that are continuing to do the wrong things? What about those countries that are continuing to invest in the wrong types of um, agricultural practices? And, and I think it's really key at this time, again, I, I mentioned the pandemic because I think one of the key learnings has been that 
actually food truly is essential. So if we go back to food is essential, therefore we need to take some control of the way in which food is produced and the impacts that it has on our environment. The way to do that is true cost accounting, but it's to do it in a way in which it is fully integrated in national budgets. It is fully integrated in the way in which our major multilateral development banks are giving assistance. We could see and envisage a system where we start to have absolutely not the pull out of food as you do in the investments within fossil energy, but the pull in of finance and capital that goes to the right places. The elimination of subsidies to ensure that actually we shift that capital to the right type of enablers in order for women to actually be owners of the land, as Michael has indicated, is not the case, and start to really be empowered. So I think that all of us have the responsibility now to say enough is enough, that we need to really put in place the right signals, those powerful signals that are going to shift the system. Otherwise, it's not going to shift on its own. And that is why Emmanuel Faber, coming back to my blog, was shifted from Danone. He's making all the right decisions on social indicators, working with the unions and doing the right thing on environmental criteria. And yet those perverse, obviously very mean, you know, those investors that want key short term profits overall and don't care about the rest are the ones that have moved them to the side. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, you know, and that's a, a, a real travesty in so many ways that companies are not realizing the urgency of these issues and, and, and not taking them on. But it's it privately held companies in some cases are doing a lot more than than the, the bigger shareholder companies. So there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Ruth, I, I don't know if you keep minding if we if we shift to some questions from the audience or if you'd like to jump in. Well, I just a quick question, because I think there's one element I want to bring into this, because I think there's been some really great discussion about um, women, about smallholder farmers. And I think what's missing here is um, uh, a focus on Indigenous peoples as well, um, which is a huge topic within the discussions around the Food Systems Summit and more generally. And maybe just before we go to additional audience questions, I'd like to just turn to Michael for a second, because... The ILC Secretariat is party to the Global Call to Action for Land Rights, which places a special emphasis on Indigenous communities. So, Michael, just maybe briefly, how do Indigenous land rights kind of impact the broader food system? Why are they so important? Why are they so neglected? And how do we bring the issues around Indigenous land rights into the conversation um, on equal footing to talking about women, smallholder farmers, and some of the other more marginalized communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, together with the partners in the Global Call to Action, we did some research a few years ago to try and calculate um, how much land is claimed uh, on the surface of the earth by indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, and the, the, the figure that uh, was estimated was a bit over 50%. So roughly half the surface of the earth is considered by indigenous peoples and local communities who live on that land, who've used it for generations and stewarded that land very well, generally. Um, as their own land. Um, but then when you correlate how much of that land is legally recognized by their governments as belonging to those communities, it's 10%. That gap of 40% is, is a huge uh, risk factor. It's a huge vulnerability factor. It's a vulnerability for the people who live on it, obviously, because they cannot defend their land rights. Now, that hasn't been a problem if there hasn't been a lot of competition. But as we see the expansion, for example, of corporate food production into parts of the world where land is considered cheaper and, and more available, um, we see a massive uh, expropriation of land and expulsion of people from the land uh, and violence uh, against the defenders from those communities who are trying to defend their land. Our, our member Global Witness last year counted 212 land defenders, the majority of whom were indigenous peoples who'd lost their lives trying to defend their community, their community land rights. But, but the important point as well is it's not just the vulnerability of those populations, but it's the vulnerability of, of what we were talking about just now, the, the ecosystems and the biodiversity and the carbon that sustain all life on earth. So um, another figure that's come out recently is an estimation of how much carbon sits in the land and the forest of indigenous people's territories around the world. And it, it is over 25 times the annual um, Earth's carbon budget, 
um, carbon, the, the amount uh, of, of carbon that the Earth uh, emits. So it's a massive amount in the region of hundreds of billions uh, of, of tons. So, so uh, if we're going to think about sustainable systems, sustainable production systems, whether, whether it's um, food production or, 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 or uh, um, maintaining biodiversity or maintaining the water towers that that feeds uh, many urban uh, areas, then recognizing the land rights of uh, of indigenous peoples um, is 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 not just their right. It's not just the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do because it's their land. But it's also good for the uh, uh, for the rest of us. And and a, a lot of a lot of the work that we're trying to do is trying to close that gap, get that ten percent further up towards the fifty percent, uh, which is where it should be. Thank you so much, Michael. It's super important, and I really appreciate um, you making the connection to peace and conflict. I think that's another big part of the food system as we think about a systems perspective. Um, I've also seen a shout out in um, some of the comments from the audience uh, for youth and a real need to focus on youth. Of course, that's a really strong priority for the UN Food System Summit, so appreciate that. And Danny, I'm seeing tons of stuff in here. It's so rich around seed saving, around corporate consolidation of supply chains, you know, you name it, it's in here, uh, which is fantastic to see that kind of engagement. So maybe back over to you for a few more audience questions. Sure, I, I, I love this audience so much. Thank you all for being so engaged. Um, there have been some questions about circular economy. So Naoko, I, I'm hoping I can turn to you um, and shift gears a little bit. You've written extensively about the benefits of, of circular economy in connection with your with your work uh, at, at the GAF, co-chairing co the platform for accelerating the circular economy. And, and I'm wondering if you can answer the question, how could wasted resources be funneled back into production? And how do you think, um, you know, a TCA framework or the tea fabric or food framework that we discussed before could help facilitate that? Wow, it's a big question. <laughs> a little unexpected. Actually, the, when we think about why food system transformation is so important, the answer, the fundamental answer is the current economic model, including food system, production consumption, energy system, city system are all hitting the planetary boundaries so that we all need to think about how to transform the way we live into somehow into this and uh, safe operating space. The circularity, pursuing the circularity is, is really the key solution uh, to this and uh, uh, joint challenge. And it's estimated that uh, 45 percent of the actually that uh, the uh, GHG uh, uh, if it needs to be reduced to to achieve that uh, net zero by 2050 can be actually that done, done by uh, pursuing the circularity. And when we think about this and the food system uh, from circularity lens, there are several important entry points to it. Actually, when people think about circularity, originally it was more like a plastic, that then how to stem that the plastic going into the ocean, but it's much deeper. It's really related to our way of uh, producing and consuming in terms of the food. It's all applied to that where the fertilizer comes from. And if we apply the fertilizer, in the right way, and how we can actually that, that think about this bio, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the material is into the, uh, the production, and then how we can uh, minimize the waste at each of the uh, supplies in the values. So it's not just the food waste at the end of the pipe. It's really from production to trade to export import to that then uh, to the value chain. So I believe that then uh, again that if we were able to count those kind of true costs, it will significantly help our way of achieving, actually then, uh, uh, providing the solution to it. There is uh, some good news is that uh, uh, digitalization, the blockchain, that will definitely help us to make our value chain much more efficient and effective so that then, uh, we, we have some uh, very uh, sweet spot, the bright light uh, to, to achieve it. Um, but uh, um, I think that the uh, uh, um, that, that fundamentally, uh, to, to me, it goes back to this topic of today's discussion, how close we are to really count this and the true cost. To me, that is all, you know, that, that's all that the, the uh, foundation of any kind of 
informed decision making, either the policy makers, the producer, consumer, and, and the investors. And my question for this panel and for the audience is, is this a good way for us to think that then, uh, can we borrow that the fact that climate change pass from TCFD to, uh, to this narrative that the, is that the nature can really follow this uh, climate pathway? Can we shorten that long <laughs> digestion period a little shorter? Or we need more than that because nature is not necessarily that easy to count like carbon. So that it seems to me we can learn from the fact that climate change actually that then, uh, 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 go through or evolve, but we need a little bit more than climate change because it's complexity uh, of the nature. So I hope that I do answer your question, uh, but let me uh, get back to you, over to you. Thanks so much. And I, I think, you know, we do have to keep looking at this so holistically and so broadly, but your question to the panelists, I wonder if anyone wants to comment on that. Anyone? <laughs> it's a big question. I asked her a big question. Um, I, I, I'd like to go back to the point about youth, uh, Sandrine. Um, and uh, the, the Club of Rome focuses on youth leadership and intergenerational dialogues. And I'm wondering, you know, what recommendations you have for youth who might be watching this, young people who want to get more involved in, in True Cost Accounting or, you know, the UN Food System Summit and how they can be part of the solution. Thank you so much. And I'm so pleased you asked me that question because we also have a, a wonderful youth ambassador within our resilience track. Mike Kunga who is also leading one of the, the major youth discussions actually for the food summit. And he's our vice chair. And he brought in actually some incredible youth coming in from some of the most conflict induced zones um, from Yemen, uh, from parts of Africa, etc. And to be frank, I think we need to start realizing that youth are absolutely already engaged. They are part of the solution. They're the ones that are actually setting up nutrition banks. They're the ones that are actually setting up community services. Let's not forget again that during the pandemic, we discovered across Europe, the US and elsewhere that it, youth were part of the real solution, the glue within communities to ensure that people had access, that people were getting deliveries, etc. So youth are the solution. And, and we need to get away from just this tokenism of, you know, now in particular, we want to have intergenerational dialogue. So we put in a couple of youth and then we've done it. No, that's not it. We actually need to co-create solutions with the youth. They've got all kinds of creative new thinking around how we can do this. Part of the conversation that we've also had is how can you put in place the right disaster and risk management systems that are both centralized and decentralized? And within that, women and youth are going to play a huge role because the decentralization aspect is all around community leadership and, and knowing also that youth are wanting also within university structures to better understand complexity, to better be part of the future, rather than just to be told that because you're going on a climate march, you're trying to skip out of school. No, actually going on the climate march is that you're trying to ensure that actually your future is bigger and brighter than what it is today. And that's more important than going to school. So we have to totally forget the past around how we envisaged youth and really bring in youth as the glue in terms of some of the future solutions and their innovation as really enablers in terms of this co-creation in the new food summit that we want to have. Absolutely. That was so well said, so beautifully said. And I, I love that you said youth are the glue uh, that are holding communities together, especially during COVID. It's something that I've seen and talked to a lot of youth about. So it's wonderful. I want to make sure that Ruth has enough time to sort of bring this all together for us. Um, thank you all so much for your really rich dialogue. This has been fascinating. Ruth, over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. I've been madly scribbling away here as you both um, providing amazing insights. Um, so let me try. It's a tough, a tough task, but let me try. So the first point I think is back to Santrine's point that food is a public good. It is essential. And that has to override every conversation we have around the food system summit, around food systems transformation, and around all the deep food issues that we're all grappling with. The second thing sort of connected to that, but slightly different is 
Um, Naoko's very good point about how the economic system doesn't do it anymore. Um, we really need to focus on social contract and think very differently about the ways that we're coming together around um, food systems change from a different angle and not just um, making a priority um, uh, focused on profit and short-term goals. The third thing I want to say that I've heard from all of you is the, the deep, deep issues of equity and really recognizing those, as Sandrine said, who have no choice and no plate. Uh, Michael also spoke about smallholders and increasing inequity. We've talked about women, Indigenous people. Um, you know, this really has to be held up as a core principle of any solution that we identify, not just solutions that are you know, scalable and actionable and all of that, but, but solutions that really attend to the deep values that we hold as a global community, like equity and inclusion. The fourth thing I would like to hold up is that finance is a lever for change. <laughs> True cost accounting is a really powerful um, lever of change. And I think a number of you have said the financial system itself needs to be overhauled. Um, and we really have to have bold ambitions around how we're thinking about finance um, and how we're pivoting away from finance that prioritizes kind of negative impacts um, to um, prioritize financial systems that have positive impacts. Number five, there are a bunch of specifics that were, were elevated. So practical instruments, practical tools like teabag for food, like true cost accounting. Um, there was a lot of chat in the, in the chat box, the, the comments from the audience, as well as from the panelists around the importance of agroecology, regenerative agriculture, um, whatever terminology you use, um, you know, agriculture that is done according to ecological principles that work in harmony with this beautiful planet that we have and not against this beautiful planet we have. Other specifics, uh, we talked about subsidies, taxes, um, pulling in positive investments, connecting the local and global. Naoko talked about the, the local commons and the global commons, um, of course, indigenous land rights. Um, and finally, I just want to say that this is part of a series um, looking at the Global Alliance's seven calls to action. Number one is inclusive participatory rights-based governance. Number two is public research for public good. And as happens at the Global Alliance, we can't talk about any one of them without talking about all of them because they're all entirely connected. So part of this conversation has been around governance, which is more than just governments and how governments rule. Governance is who has a seat at the table, who has a voice at the table. And again, pointing to indigenous peoples, to women, to small scale producers, to youth, really um, co as Sandrine said, co-creating and ensuring that that's on equal footing and not just as a um, you know check the box kind of um, process. So governance as absolutely central. And then public research for Baba Good, Zhao, you were talking about um, science and evidence, research and development around agroecology, and really ensuring that we start to pivot towards looking at um, the research we need that is in the service of food as a public good. So just want to um, say thank you myself. I'll hand it over to Danny in a second, but I also just want to shout out to all the participants. You can find our calls to action on Twitter and YouTube. We are really open to feedback. These are an iterative process. We're really wanting to be very open to the community about what's missing, what could be refined. Um, so we really encourage you to engage in this discussion with us on an ongoing basis. This has been a fantastic conversation and over to you, Danny, for the last word. Thank you so much. And thank you for another brilliant wrap up, Ruth. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to the panelists again, and also this really amazing, informed and engaged audience who's been with us. I wish I could have shared all of, of your messages to the panelists. Uh, a reminder that this will also be on our, our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nierenberg. And I hope you'll all join us on April 7th at 9 a.m. Eastern time when we will be discussing developing sustainable fiscal policy for the food system. Thank you all again. Please stay safe.